Following a Prayer is a novel about uh, three inquisitive young girls. Kalpana, a 12-year-old girl in a village nestled in the dense hills of the Western Ghats, goes missing one morning. When she returns, she has gone silent. Nothing can get her to speak. What happened in those three days that she went missing? What prevents her from communicating with her parents and sister except through notes and scribbles as the village prepares to celebrate the annual deepavali festival a rumor spreads that kalpana will speak the day after what will she say and what will be the impact of her words the novel's writer dr sundar sarukai has a phd in particle physics from the university of purdue and works primarily in the philosophy of the natural and the social sciences he founded barefoot philosophers an organization that conducts workshops across the country teaching philosophy and rational thinking to school children formerly he was a professor at the national institute of advanced studies and also was the founder director of the manipal center for philosophy and humanities He is the author of Translating the World Science and Language Philosophy of Symmetry J.R.D. Tata and the Ethics of Philanthropy and two books co-authored with Gopal Guru The Crack Mirror an Indian Debate on Experience and Theory and more recently Experience Caste and the Everyday Social In show notes you can find the links to buy the book Following a Prayer and uh, the youtube channel barefoot philosophers where the basics of philosophy lessons to children are uh, available dr sundar sarukai welcome to our podcast harshniyam thank you and it's pleasure to be here uh, could you please explain uh, what is uh, philosophy in uh, common parlance um philosophy is uh, a way of thinking about the world a way of understanding the world a way of seeing the world that's why the indian philosophical term for philosophy is darshana which is also seeing sight if you like it's a way of seeing the truth behind the world of appearance so the world always appears in a particular way the sun looks like it is moving the earth is looks like it's stationary but you know we look for the truth behind this apparent motion what looks like sun is moving is actually something else so this constant search to uncover the hidden meaning which is also called knowledge and truth is really the fundamental concern of philosophy in all traditions i think the most fundamental concern of philosophy is to understand uh, what is the real nature of the of reality what is this reality uh, since the world is so full of appearances right and uh, that largely is where that, that that's the reason why a lot of scientific method also comes from philosophical method because science was part of philosophy in that sense and uh, you know we this constant search towards asking towards questioning towards asking the foundations of your own beliefs at each every time that becomes a kind of a way of understanding what philosophy is and it's also something as uh, you know as we know many philosophers often ask this question what is philosophy so it's a self reflectivity you you don't want to take anything for granted and assume you want to understand under what conditions can i say something so they have been asking what is the definition of philosophy one of the definitions i often use in my teaching is some people think of philosophy as thinking about thinking so human processes are characterized by you know thinking as something very unique to us and so a lot of philosophical questions arise from trying to understand the nature of this thinking the you know trying to uh, understand and nature of thinking is very complex it can be it, we we make inferences which is called logic we use language and we think through language so there are so many interesting aspects of thinking and philosophy is a way of trying to discover those you know deeper aspects of thinking what were uh, those uh, early influences uh, uh, to choose teaching philosophy as a career option i think the most important early influence was family i guess the kind of family environment i grew up in 
uh, I think my father was very interested in literature and philosophy too, although he was a scientist. And um, I was, uh, you know, I really enjoyed in my school days uh, doing physics and maths. And I decided then that I want to work further on quantum theory and stuff. So I had a good idea and in school what interested me. But um, I also grew up in the house which is filled with books of various kinds, particularly literature and music and stuff and a little bit of philosophy. So, but then, you know, we were never, we never had philosophy as a course in school or college. So I didn't know what it was as a discipline. I saw philosophy more like literature in a sense, you know, and, and my first, uh, I think in the, in teenage, of course, you get a little more aware of some of these books. And I had, I had an old book of Nietzsche, which was lying around in my house. And so that looked like one kind of a very radical thinking and that attracted me to it. And, uh, you know, so basically it was that. Uh, but I didn't really think of it as a career. I just thought of it as something which I was reading and enjoying. It's uh, only when I went to the US to do my PhD in physics that I discovered you could actually take courses in philosophy. And then I ended up studying with two people in the in, at Purdue for nearly five years. I took almost all the courses which one of them gave, Professor Weinstein. And, uh, you know, so I, I got intro- introduced to the idea of philosophy as a discipline which is very different from philosophy, just as a kind of reading a hobby or kind of thing. So it became more of as a kind of an idea of what do they do as a discipline. And then I decided after my PhD in physics that I want to continue the work I was doing in the philosophy courses. And I shifted to philosophy as my main research interest. Your organization, the Barefoot Philosophers, why did you start it and... uh... Uh, what is the kind of work uh, that is getting done? We started my career in philosophy. I joined the National Institute of Advanced Studies, which is within the Indian of Science campus in Bangalore, 94. And, you know, there are a small group of people, primarily retired scientists, who are interested in some larger questions. And they were interested in really jump-starting some philosophy of science program. So it was a good match for me to join that group. Um, I was there for 15 years, 15, 16 years, till 2010. Um, you know, it is primarily research institute, but I was very interested in teaching because we were seeing that philosophy was not being taught. Even in universities, were closing down philosophy departments, no faculty, no students, you know, the similar problems, a lot of problems with teaching philosophy. But I used to teach, even though NIAS was a research institute, I used to do a lot of teaching for students in different forums. I used to run summer schools teach a certificate course in a college and all that. Try to see if we can get people interested in philosophy. But then around 2010, I moved to Manipal to set up a center for philosophy and humanities to start a regular program, a MA program in what I called interdisciplinary humanities. It had philosophy, sociology, and literature. Because I really think philosophy should be taught in conjunction with these other disciplines. And it was very interesting. We had a very vibrant, dynamic program. We I was there for, I was associated with it for six years. And then I came back to NIAS. But I realized that, you know, the struggle with trying to teach philosophy to adults was also not perhaps that much the worth the effort because the kind of effort you put in to train PhD students or postgraduate students. And, I, and given what was happening in the country, and I was very worried about various kinds of social issues around the country at that time, and so I decided maybe we should start focusing on children. So I, and children, and also I had grand plans of also engaging with politicians, actually, you know, um, having workshops for uh, people who are in the legislature on ethics and ideas of social society and all that stuff. But so I, you know, thought of a, project and the Tata Trust funded me initially. Uh, I was still at NIAS and I had a group of my PhD students at that time and a couple of research assistants we had hired to start this uh, project of trying to bring philosophy to the public, making it meaningful to citizens rather than just writing, you know, all my philosophy books for academics and so on. So we did, uh, you know, so like organizing public lectures, events, workshops for the public. And 
we had a hope of trying to produce a lot of simple texts and philosophy for the public and so on mainly to start making them understand both critical thinking you know very critically analyzing some issue as well as having a very empathetic approach to uh, human society you know particularly focusing on questions of dignity and respect for all citizens in the society and so that was the aim and so i had this group of uh, students who started off with me and the first thing i suddenly decided i mean it was not the original plan but then at one point i suddenly decided maybe i should do this for children like i had been doing for post grad students a workshop on philosophy for children and that was so successful that i not stopped doing it so i continue to do it in different forums different languages but what happened this is just before covid and um, then i quit nias and unfortunately the the tata trust didn't continue the project money since i left nias although it is a project conceptualized by me right from the beginning but so i said is that's okay because you know as um i had felt that i had to do this at a much broader scale so i came out and i've uh, just been writing so from the workshops i did this book on philosophy for children which is now in many languages including in telugu uh, kannada malayalam uh, tamil etc hindi so through that we've been trying to get more children so it's not like trying to teach children philosophy you know that's a that's not the aim the point is to teach them the foundations of you know thinking carefully about what they study how they learn so which means not just asking questions but being aware of how they think they're aware of the language they use how does language work you know basically trying to get them to inside their you know questioning and their way of understanding what they are doing becoming more self aware individuals in their learning so and but then you know covid came and all my students graduated and they all got jobs in good places so i was only unemployed guy hanging around so i continued doing what i could uh, post covid doing some workshops here and there and but what it also gave me those four years i wrote you know many of my books that i wanted to write all that which i was able to do some of which are public i mean after philosophy for children i did another book primarily for the public called on ethics of philanthropy jrd tata on ethics of philanthropy and then a following that a book on democracy drawing on ambedkar vision of democracy that is also meant as i said all all that i see as part of the barefoot um, idea that we need to bring these ideas to the public so this book on democracy questions people's you know understanding of democracy and tries to make them engage with uh, ideas such as ambedkar's more seriously um and then it in some sense it naturally came to this novel where my it's i i was not doing philosophy i was already trying to write differently and always i've always been writing fiction and i enjoy that enormously but during covid i just sat and wrote it and i had some time so i thought this is one way to you know explore my own ideas rather than tell a story per se explore my own ideas about language sound religion and so on and i thought fiction was the best way of making you know communicating these questions so far it's been like this very informal way but now now that uh, we are doing more of these workshops in rural areas and one of the schools in um, tamil nadu outside salem called agn school has now introduced uh, philosophy as a regular curriculum one hour every week in a classroom uh, based on this philosophy for children book and i've been working with them we'll produce all class materials for them so now all 250 students in the ninth class will be doing philosophy every week on once a week as part of the regular class so hopefully you know as i said it's not just about you know just about logical thinking and so on it is that and also about humanistic learning about social learning being more sensitive to society um, not reducing you know everything in terms of individual merit which is such a dangerous concept in india today you know making them realize um, how one performs why somebody who is not performing well is not able to perform not because of some construction like intelligence but due to various social factors and so on yeah so that is so i'm now planning to you know make it more formal and develop it further uh soon that's the plan faction
is there any connect between uh, literary fiction and uh, philosophy how do you compare them uh, philosophy is not as much concerned about the individual the trajectory of the individual as much as it is about some general universal statements that you can make you know uh, you want to talk about human nature rather than about a particular person's trajectory of learning even if there is a particular story i want to extrapolate some common universal tendencies of it and so on right so it's a very different um, approach to a narrative to telling something about the world so the literature um, is immersed in following the subject through her own stories through her experiences through her own language so for example typically you will have dialogues people talking you know as if they are very important parts of fiction in philosophy of course you don't have that in social science you don't have that you can do social science studying people and yet you will not write social science in that manner right because it is a it is more influenced by philosophy and scientific methods so there is a fundamental distinction in the way the narrative how the story is told one two it is also the difference is philosophy is trying to convince you of a particular position you know whether the world is real whatever it you want to say whether there is a ghost or there is no ghost etc it gives you arguments for it um it makes it tries to convince you look you can look at it this manner somebody says this but i want to say something else etc whereas literature is least interested in listing what everybody else has thought about it i'm not, i'm not interested in a right fiction i'm not interested in giving you all the arguments for a particular position you know so in my story a girl can just say uh, god does not exist and i don't have to list all kinds of arguments which philosophers have given whether god exists or god does not exist because it is just a story of an individual and because literature gives me that freedom to say i'm only telling you the story of this character i stick with the character if the character knows the answer and it can if the character is a philosopher then i can write philosophy but if the character is somebody else who doesn't know that then she will just say oh i don't believe in god and go on that's the end of my story i can't i'm not giving you an argument to for and against that position you know the, i'm saying the ma- the major the final point is the major aim of these different type of texts of philosophy and literature uh, you know for a lot of uh, art in general and also for literature fiction there is when i when somebody writes fiction they also want to make you feel about something i write about the character because i want you to have an emotional response to the character's life to what has happened to her and what she is thinking right uh, you may laugh you may cry whatever it is but philosophical texts are not meant to do that they are not written in that way in fact if you write it like that they won't see it as philosophy because even emotion has been universalized and abstracted you can't feel that you know so they are very different goals they have as disciplines yeah on one level uh, following a prayer uh, the novel uh, reads like a thriller uh, simultaneously it raises uh, certain fundamental questions like uh, what is a language uh, what are words about music how do we categorize uh, this novel um uh, well i i'm saying that to call it philosophy will be a problem because it's not a philosophical text in the sense uh i see first of all there are characters there are stories that are happening and so even if there is a let's say there is a, a element there when they ask you know what does a word mean how does a word get its meaning for example you know for example if you want to if the character the girl says god is a lie and then because you are using a word to call god but i don't see that god okay that's a very simple quick response of a child because she is upset at something and she says i keep calling out for god i don't see that person at all so this whole thing is a lie now if i was writing a philosophy about that i could have started with that by saying there is a question that when we refer when i call the when i use a word like chair i can point out to the object chair when i use the name of a god what am i pointing out to i can begin with, that's a philosophical question and it the text becomes philosophical when i draw on different arguments 
So to answer this, I'll begin by what does sound mean? What does language and word mean? And how words denote? And how some words don't denote? How there are some things which are abstract entities which words can denote? And God could be an abstract that all entities don't have to be physically real, etc., etc. I can give you an old argument explaining this question and answering that girl. But in this is not a philosophy book because I am not as an author. I am not answering the girl. I'm not even trying to answer the girl. The author is not there at all because I know an answer to that question she's asking, let us say, because I teach philosophy of language. So I can immediately say, oh, this is what you mean. Uh, why don't you look at it that way? But I am not present in the novel. It can only be those girls and what happens to them. I'm, I'm an observer, not, uh, not somebody trying to share some ideas and thoughts and knowledge. So I'm an observer. I'm just watching these girls, something happening in their life. And I'm writing it down. Right? So it is actually quite difficult because I have to stop myself from saying, no, no, I know the answer to this. Let me give you this way. It may not be the full answer. The girl will have a response to it. Right? But at least I have to. So I'm not trying to do any of that. So following a prayer is a, I would say it's a novel, of course. It's a, just a story. And I think it's a very simple story as such. But um, there may be philosophical themes in it, but the book is not philosophy. That's the crucial point. It is not philosophical in any sense of the word. So, can we say that uh, uh, the experience of uh, working with uh, barefoot philosophers, uh, teaching children uh, philosophy across Tamil Nadu and Karnataka, conducting workshops, uh, prompted you to write this book uh, following a prayer? No, actually, I think the idea of this following a prayer has been there much before I did this workshop for children. Um, in the sense, because as I said, one of my central concerns in all my philosophy books has been about language and how does language function. My first book was actually called Translating the World, Science and Language. Um, so I've been thinking about these questions for a long time, but you need a proper framework to do that. I, so I, do, I don't think that Following a prayer was uh, because of my philosophy workshops. But the form of the novel, the way the story took place was definitely um, not directly influenced, but definitely doing those philosophy workshops gave me confidence to do it as a children, you know, as a story set among three children. You know, I had tried writing one version of it for adults with adults as a character and it was sounded very bad. Um, you know, and I could imagine. And but at the moment I discovered the story of this girl, um, you know, this young girl, I always knew, I mean, many years back, I remember vaguely when I was in Simla, I think I'd got this idea somewhere of somebody running behind a prayer. But um, I think the point was that it, then I didn't know what to do with it, obviously, you know. But once I got this Kalpana, in my head clearly that she runs behind the prayer and comes back totally without and refuses to speak then i think the whole novel fell in place in the novel uh, there are uh, three kids girls and again uh, their mother uh, of course uh, very important character their grandmother and a folk singer uh, gangamma uh, these are all women other than, of course, uh, their teacher, who is a male, and uh, father, who is very, very tacit. He doesn't speak much. Is there any particular uh, reason for this? You know, actually, uh, even in my other fiction I've done, I mean, the published ones are only my plays. There are three of my plays that have been translated to uh, Tamil and they've been published as a book. But um, even in, I had written two other novels you know, uh, earlier, which have not been published because I didn't follow up on any of them. Um, it's actually very difficult to break into this whole publishing racket, you know. And it so happened as an interesting story of how this book got published. But anyway, uh, since I was anyway doing philosophy, I had a job, etc. You know, I would write and if nobody responded, I didn't. I said, okay, forget it. I wrote it just for what I wanted to write. But why I'm saying that is in almost all the texts I have written, fiction, uh, the central characters of women. And I, I think it's also because, you know, I, I, I think that uh, the kind of um, the, the most powerful citizens in a society 
no, not socially, very ironically, um, have been women. And very, you know, I think even as students, I can tell you with, um, I mean, you know, boys, I'm not saying this, by saying this, I'm not saying anything about boys, I mean, male students, but I've always found uh, girl students to be far better as students, um, far more sincere. And the reason is I'm not reducing it to biological male and female here. The reason could be the fact that they don't seem so entitled. There's always a set of vulnerabilities. They have fought much more to come to the point to be to study either their postgraduate or PhD. It's not an easy thing to just walk in and say, I want to do this. For men, there's a lot of entitlement. They believe that, you know, either they are brilliant or they have a right to expect something from teachers and so on. With women, it's always been about their uh, receptivity to learning, their struggle of having, being in that place, surviving in that place. And I found that even in the children's workshops I did, you know, some of the male kids would always get up in class saying, they'll always want to ask questions. They'll always want to say something. And they would say something which they would have read in some Wikipedia, some book, you know, very, what they think is very smart. The girls are always in the sessions I've done. Even, as I said, so many of them with hundreds of kids now. Um, they'll always be more gentle when they respond to these questions. They're they are hesitant. They, You know, there's a vulnerability. They want to know. They want to, you have to give them the conditions for them to get up and ask and all of that. And for in a large sense, I mean, I'm not sure. I'm sure there are girls who are different and so on. But the point is for me, I found... Um, you know, that spirit. So there's a lot about the book, as you say, which is about the essence of teaching. And to me, if there is anything which defines my interest right from childhood, it's about teaching. I, I really see myself as a teacher. You know, I enjoy teaching the most. So I can, so in a sense, it's my exploration of what it is to teach. What am I teaching? You know, and who are the ones who are listening and learning and building from it? So I really think um, the girl characters, in not just in learning in schools and teaching, but also as uh, people in a society are much stronger characters for my literary imagination all the time. I found uh, Gangamma, the folk singer character, uh, very, very interesting and intriguing. There are some really beautiful passages of uh, prose written uh, when uh, uh, the interaction happens uh, between Gangama and uh, the kids. No, that's very true. And I think uh, Gangama also, I mean, I'm saying actually the style of my writing in this novel is uh, more minimalist in the sense I, because I know the topics themselves may seem like, oh, what are all these questions about language and God and religion and music? But most of it is about, um, you know, trying to evoke feelings. So I want to experiment with language. I want it to touch you in various ways and so on. And Gangamma was a very important character because as part of the story, you know, once she goes behind the sound of God and the girl thinks gods are all lies and they don't really exist, then you have to explore the idea, what do God's words mean and what do words to this unseen, uh, you know, whatever it could mean for a child, from a child's imagination. And the only way to really explore it without writing philosophy, without making it a philosophy book is to bring in music. Because I think music's engagement, you know, I'm very deeply, I love music. I listen to music all the time. And when I write, I'm always writing with music. So there was, you know, there is something close about, I mean, it's about me, which is present in that. And so there are a lot of subtle messages throughout the book about various things about feminism, caste, and so on, which have all been part of my uh, philosophy book, particularly my work on caste, but not explicitly mentioned anywhere in the book. So I want to, I, I, you know, I think these are instead of telling people something, I want to make them experience and feel and uh, get them to think about it, right? It provoked them into thinking, oh God, this is what you're saying. So Gangama, you know, the question of music was very important and we have to understand why is music so important in the pers- in the search for God, for example. Um, why is it so much of a bhakti thing about music? 
what does music got to do with it and there's some very rich theories of music in uh, indian traditions of course and also very interestingly there are all these nomadic singers in indian uh, society which are you know who are all sing philosophical ideas but they're all through songs you know there are, I, i remember there's a woman who used to come past the house at least three times four times a week she is a nomadic singer uh, i don't think consciously gangama is modeled on her because i was really talking about rural performers of this tradition of this philosophical tradition which is present throughout karnataka and other places um but this woman would come every day morning i mean whenever she came once in two three days she would walk through all the streets just singing primarily these vachanas you know beautiful singing she has no she just has the accompaniment of that symbols like thing and uh, she just walk around all the houses so she would come here and would be talking to her many times my wife and i and you know and she is filled with troubles in her life her uh, granddaughter was in hospital somebody had a problem but you know she would just come people would give her something maybe some 50 rupees 20 rupees whatever if she comes every day people give less some food they have some rice whatever but you should just listen to that singing you know it resonates through the road as she goes singing and every day i mean she's doing that across the streets in the morning every day and i'm like what is the life of these people what sustains them and uh, and it's happening across the state and other places in india in very many different ways and that to me is a very important aspect of philosophy so that whole section there i'm also writing a critique of philosophy what has happened in india reducing it to departments and reading some texts you know become very shastric in every sense whether we do western philosophy we are stuck with some western philosophical texts and we don't know whether we understand it or students understand it you know i'm not saying that is right or wrong i mean that's one one type of way of doing philosophy but here the this grand you know grand ideas which are all about enquiring about something about life about people about society but using a completely different medium so i want to understand that i'm not saying this is better or that is better you know i i left the philosophy yes. departments formally i don't want to be associated with that so i'm out of it in some sense but you know what is this doing it is so much filled in our society across the country go from kashmir to kanyakumari anywhere you will find different variations of this so she is a very important character for me because she is the one who gives voice she is a voice of wisdom also and she is uh, not a dominant member of a society so i'm i'm taking a dig there i think there's some kind of a sarcastic point towards you know people who are the who are seen as the wisest people in a society who are they what are they here is a woman who is an outcast basically living on the edge of society breaks all social norms but it's a woman who is exploring the world through sound and music and she is a singer she does that but when she encounters kalpana and for me kalpana is character which uh, opens up enormous amount of ways of you know touches me at different levels because i am always a uh, stray struggle with the fact about why is language so important for humans and how difficult it is for humans to control their language and here is a little girl of 12 years who says language is a lie and refuses to speak what is the strength it's only gangama who realizes her not speaking is a strength when she comes here to learn music she is puzzled how can a girl who refuses to speak learn music and that's the whole story of the second part so yeah i agree with you i think she's a very important presence which holds the novel together the other uh, interesting part is uh, there is no division of chapters in the book the whole novel there are no breaks in between and uh, it flows like a continuous uh, stream of uh, classical music composition you know when i wrote it i just wrote it okay um i didn't realize that i had actually written it uh, in that sense it's only after i wrote it and i went back and looked at it typed it all in and i said hey there's no you know <laughs> the chapters here i mean it's not that i have a problem with chapters because i have um, 
I mean, other novels, for example, I have, are, have chapters and all that. But uh, yeah, it was a bit of a surprise. I think I was deeply immersed in the novel as I was writing. And as I said, I'm also doing a lot of experiments with language in writing this. I'm trying to make language speak rather than language just represents something. So I want language to physically affect the reader. You know, it's not just about some words which are there. So I was so deeply immersed in it. I really think I didn't realize I had not done any chapters. And I lived with them, talked with them. I mean, it was like I was just sitting with them around the table. So when I wrote the whole thing and everything was done and I was typing, etc., then as I said, suddenly it struck me there was no thing. And then I said, well, I like that. I'll keep it this way. So I'm glad you see it as a kind of a music thing. In a sense, it's like an alap. Yeah, that's a good way to characterize it. Yeah, it's actually an alap, I think. Yeah, long one, but yeah. So this is uh, my last question. I found uh, the ending to be very, very metaphorical. Even the beginning of the novel, for that matter. Uh, do you mean to say the relentless search for the unknown or the relentless uh, search for self-realization is what makes uh, human beings uh, unique? Okay, so there's a lot of very it's an interesting deep question. Um, as I said, okay, this is a story of a search of this girl, right? And like a girl who doesn't know how to ask these questions, she reacts and does things like this impulsively. I refuse to speak any language. I refuse to go to school. But, you know, in all this, somebody might actually see parallels with people who go in, you know, who become very religious or become great scientists or whatever. You know, any search has a cost. Any search has a particular drive to it, right? And so there is this, this I mean, as the search is actually the story and also this, this exploration of silence, I think, was very important for me there, you know. I think through Kalpana, Kalpana is silent, but it needs great strength for her to be silent. Like as I said, that's really why silence, as you know, for example, with, uh, as as a technique of control, Gandhi uses it on his weekly one day silence form of self control. You can be silent for one day a week. It's like fasting. They're very similar to that. You can control that desire, control that desire to speak. And which I think is the most powerful human impulse. And it's also that impulse which causes most problems in people's lives. You know, whether as within between individuals or within society. You know, if all of us just uh, shut up more, it'll be good. Like I remember one of the readers uh, who read it, you know, he didn't contact me after he finished it. And then he calls me for two, three days and said, you know, last two days I didn't want to speak. I wanted to be in silence. You know, the silence is something which we are we try and engage with because given that language we have, we just use it all the time, completely wastefully, uselessly, needless, you know. And it is this girl who's got that. And even the other girls, her sister, who start asking these questions, they also begin to see the power of silence. So I think the larger, I mean, there's no message in it as such, but I think that's the only way I, I can see this, that anybody who goes in search of, it's not in search of sound or philosophy or language or gods or music. It is that anybody who goes in search of knowledge and truth will be pulled into dark corners. Whether they can come out or not, we don't know. Sometimes they do, sometimes they may not. But everybody, great artists, great scientists, anybody who has gone in, in this exploration, and of course, you know, mystics and others have always struggled with coming out in some sense or the other. So, in a sense, it is a metaphorical end, but in a sense, it is the only way you can end the novel. For me, the story at least. Uh, very interestingly, most of, almost all the younger people who read it, because one of the things I'm very happy about this novel is even college-going kids can read it. Um, and there are different layers to it, you know, so adults, of course, can read it at different levels. But, but with all the people, younger people who read it, 
all of them loved the ending you know they felt it was also about liberatory in various ways but with some mothers who read it you know they felt that you know i mean like i mean the ending is of course you have to read the ending to figure out what it is but i giving you an example one of the uh, one of one woman um, not a mother actually an older woman who was reading this um, in a discussion in a in a book discussion in a public forum she said how could you make this little girl go through this trauma of not speaking she felt how could you make kalpana suffer through this whole thing because they all got so identified with these people so i know i mean i uh, what can i say i i do feel bad i also feel emotionally very tied to this and a bit of suffering through the suffering of this girl when she refuses to speak and goes through it and um but i think that's the only way i mean it's a story i mean it's just a human story at that level you know and uh, so there were different kinds of responses but i'm you know i'm very glad with all the fact that people took the trouble and responded and were able to share this response you know and i would have thought you know this is all in my imagination i've written a story which you know you know how this is how it is then i get an email from a person who is actually a trans woman who wrote that uh, the book is completely you know spoke so deeply to her experience as a child uh, you know she was uh, you know in this very paradoxical relationship with god in a doubt she's sitting outside the temple wanting god to come and save her and at the same time not wanting it because you know there is this question of recognition of of her trans uh, sexuality and and she said this is so completely moved me that i i was still not able to come out of it and i was like oh god this is like a real story i thought i had imagined the whole thing for some people they've actually gone through it you know and that's a great thing about human imagination i think the possibilities of where people have gone through what you know for me storytelling is very important and that's why i react this is this philosophical tag to it because i am a big fan of pulp fiction i just read pulp fiction all the time and for me the, you know you have to be able to turn the pages like one of the younger people who read it told me that very interesting how he found it dynamic he said i was every time these girls asked a question to the teacher i was thinking what is the next question going to be so he was reading through the book fast to see what else are they going to ask what else are they going to do so to him it was like an adventure of these three girls in the classroom to me that's very important as telling stories that dynamism should be there that narrative movement all the time thank you thank you dr sundar for this uh, wonderful and uh, engaging conversation thank you very much no thank you anil for this for this wonderful opportunity to share this with your listeners so i should thank you for doing this <laughs>